First of all, I want to launch a preemptive strike against any critics <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, who might accuse this uh, talk of being ad hominem. First place, the ad hominem fallacy is that you attack, instead of attacking the, the doctrine of a person, you attack a person. Uh, and that's fallacious because it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't refute the argument. I've never been in favor of that. I've always been in favor of refuting the doctrine and then going on to attack the person. <laughs> So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's not an ad hominem fallacy. Uh, also, what I'm going to talk about the person of Keynes, I think, is related directly to his ideas. And so I think it's, it's also important historically what sort of a person he was and uh, how, how that did relate to his ideas. Okay, first I'm going to start by saying that Keynes' favorite political philosopher might surprise many of you as <coughs> to who it was. Uh, it was Edmund Burke. An interesting question, why was Edmund Burke? Why, here's somebody who's the, the uh, Edmund Burke, the uh, darling of conservatives or neoconservatives or whatever. And here's Keynes, who was certainly not uh, conservative in that sense, one would think. <clears throat> uh, he, liked, he was a little bit more democratic than Burke. He, of course, after all, Burke was an 18th century, uh, working in the 18th century political system, which was hardly democratic. So if you're more democratic than Burke, it doesn't say much. He was also thought that Burke left out some of the great political ideas or great ideologies that statesmen should pursue. But the three basic reasons why he liked Burke a lot, <coughs> precisely, by the way, the three basic reasons why I dislike Burke. Uh, first place, he liked the fact that Burke was opposed to uh, abstract principles. Keynes always hated principles all of his life. He said, one time he said in a, in a speech or a testimony, I'm afraid of principle, uh, per se, that is. Uh, and he was against principles, and he particularly was against individual rights. And, of course, Burke was against individual rights. Burke, Burke believed in expediency against, uh, as against abstract uh, natural rights. And this is one of the great reasons why Keynes liked them. Now, there are certain Burke theorists who claim that Burke really, really did believe in individual rights. I don't agree with them, but the point is I'm talking about what, why Keynes liked Burke. Uh, so Keynes liked Burke, one, because he was against principles and particularly against abstract individual rights. Two, he liked Burke because Burke was in favor of focusing on present, uh, on present goods and ignoring future benefits, future goals. In other words, Burke's conservatism, the fact that Burke didn't like the idea of any kind of change or radical change because he worried about future consequences, which we wouldn't know, this is a short-term position, of course. This is, fits in with Keynes's admiration for the short run and hatred of the long run. So Keynes's idea in the long run we're all dead fits in with a Burkean idea, you should concentrate on current, present questions or present costs and not worry about and not consider future benefits too much. So in other words, Burke, essentially, Burke's political philosophy was a high time preference philosophy, as was Keynes's whole outlook, which is very much in favor of present uh, benefits, present goods as against future. <clears throat> as Keynes put it, quote, it is the paramount duty of governments uh, <clears throat> and of politicians to secure the well-being of the community under the case in the present and not to run risks over much for the future. So the present orientation fits into the same with Keynes' short-run orientation. Uh, and thirdly, he admired the fact that Burke believed and ruled by an organic, organically arrived at elite, a, a ruling class, ruling elite of a British establishment big shots. And of course, since Keynes was a British establishment big shot, this fit in beautifully with... Keynes's world outlook. Uh, as Keynes, to quote Keynes, the machine itself, I mean the British state, the machine itself, he oh, me, I'm, I'm quoting from Skidelsky on, uh, on Keynes, the machine itself he believed to be sound enough if only the ability and integrity of those in charge of it could be assured. That's the key. And somebody said that this week, this weekend, that uh, who cares about, I mean, the, st the state is great. Who cares about, you shouldn't have restrictions on government rule. The state is great, provided that we know the people in charge of it are great guys, people of integrity and ability, etc., etc., which, of course, means they organically arrived at British ruling elite, i.e., himself. Because uh, uh, these three things, I think, Mark Keynes throw out his, his life, short run, attack on principles and individual rights, and... Uh, belief in the ruling elite <clears throat> with himself among it. Okay, Keynes starts off, first of all, his, his, whole, uh, his whole life was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, so to speak. He was, uh, his father was a big shot at Cambridge. John Neville Keynes was a controller at Cambridge, 
Cambridge for many years. He also was also very important for Keynes's development and uh, career. And his father was a was, had, was a close friend of Alfred Marshall, and also Marshall had certain obligations. He felt he had certain obligations to Keynes, namely that to Neville, uh, because apparently Neville was a, a close friend of Keynes, a, a, a promising scholar, but never accomplished much. Uh, the scholarly output was almost nil. He wrote a, a book on methodology, which was sort of a pedestrian book on methodology, and it, it didn't write anything else. As often happens in academia, if you can't write anything, you go into academic administration. So uh, he became a, a, a controller, financial controller of Cambridge. So, so Marshall always felt that Marshall was a, a not in his own right. I won't go into that. But anyway, Marshall always felt that he had a certain extra obligation to Neville that he didn't have to other people because the Neville didn't accomplish, didn't achieve what he was supposed to have achieved. And so this obligation uh, went on, uh, was placed on young Maynard. Uh, and so when Maynard uh, got out of Cambridge and after he was a clerk in, in the office for a while, uh, Marshall was going to retire, made sure that uh, before he retired, that Keynes got a post as a lecturer in economics at his old college, Keynes College, Cambridge. Uh, and part, half of his salary was paid by Cambridge, the other half was paid by his father, John Neville. So this is how Keynes started off in academia. By the way, Keynes knew, uh, only had one term in economics when he started lecturing in economics. He, he, he'd taken one course in Marshall. Uh, this is apparently was not unusual at the time in British academia. It was still kind of peculiar. However, uh, he knew very little economics to begin with. He had Marshall, he, wrote, he read Marshall's principles. He learned on the job, so to speak, on the job training. <clears throat> and he read Marshall's principles. He had Marshall's oral tradition, in other words, his evidence before royal commissions and his unpublished papers, and that's essentially it. Uh, a key thing about Keynes also, which has come out in recent years, he's, he was a member and leader of, this, of the Secret Society of the Apostles, the Cambridge Apostles, a uh, very powerful in-group at Cambridge. And the thing is, it wasn't just a college fraternity group. Uh, it, met, it met for the rest of Keynes' life. In other words, they had continual meetings until, until Keynes died to go back to Cambridge and have, have meetings and sessions, etc., etc. <clears throat> and um, his... Uh, the first characteristic that comes out with Keynes, Keynes' attitudes at the, and the apostles and everywhere else, uh, is, is uh, first place, Keynes' constant um, uh, emphasis on personal power and domination, uh, including, um, up to brutal domination of his fellow people, whoever is involved. Uh, in other words, power and dominance were the key to his personal relationships. Uh, the um, second of all, he was very interested in philosophy. Philosophy ruled his his life, and uh, the uh, and the philosophy which which he adopted, uh, the philosophy of G. E. Moore. And David Gordon has mentioned this before, but I'm not I'm now interested not so much in Moore himself, uh, but in Keynes's interpretation of Moore and Keynes's reaction to it. Uh, Moore is also a Cambridge apostle, and we're all close friends in this in this group. And the the philosophy which seemed to um, to dominate uh, Keynes was. Uh, a bitter attack on bourgeois morality. This, this seems to be the key to Keynes's life and thought. Uh, an attack on any kind of conventional or middle class of bourgeois morality, uh, both in personal matters, sexual matters, and in ideological matters. <clears throat> so uh, it's an attack on uh, heterosexuality is inferior, attack on thrift, attack on bourgeois family life, and, and the whole business. Uh, and Schumpeter sort of alludes to this and in a, in a sort of a subtle fashion by constant, constantly talking about Keynes' childless vision. Uh, and um, so Keynes' emphasis on the short run and short run hedonism, etc., as, as being a key to, to uh, life. So the attack on thrift starts from the very beginning, and this attack and this, of course, culminates in this call for the euthanasia of the Rantier class, the, mer the mercy killing of the creditor class, which is sort of, the, of course, the epitome of bourgeois life, it's the thrifty creditor and thrifty saver. <clears throat> Okay, his interpretation of G.E. Moore, uh, they keep referring, they will know more than I do about this, they keep referring to Moore as a, as a pure, more tremendous personal charisma, apparently, uh, with Keynes and everybody else, and they keep referring to his, the purity of his intellect. In fact, he was pure, sort of like a living embodiment of pure intellect. He had no small talk, he, he would make sort of crazy statements. To me, he sounds like a nutty poser, but what do I know? I'm the, that's, it wasn't, he's not, not, not my type of guy, let's say sort of that way. At any rate, he seemed to impress everybody else at King's College, Cambridge. And uh, when, 
Moore wrote the Principia Ethica in 1903, Keynes said in retrospect and said at the time, so we have two checks here. In other words, he said this is the great revelation. Uh, quoting from Keynes, the book was exciting, exhilarating, the beginning of a new renaissance, the opening of a new heaven on earth. Talking about Keynes' millennialism, that's an interesting phrase here. Uh, that, and that, that's what he said in retrospect about uh, 30 years later when he was talking about Procipi Ethica. At the time, he said it was stupendous, entrancing, the greatest book on the subject, wondrous and original, and original a true theory of ethics. Um, the, um, now, it seems to be that the true theory of ethics basically was, at least the way Keynes interpreted it, uh, was a rejection of, of bourgeois morality and rejection of any kind of general rules. But Keynes hated most of all in life as general rules and ethical rules or any, sort of, any other sort of rules, and therefore emphasis on personal, uh, personal whim, personal caprice, personal will. I think it fits in with, with Keynes' entire will to power. And uh, he felt that any general rules were limiting, limited the freedom, uh, to, for freedom to power on the part of the individual. So, uh, so there's a shift to a personal ethics, personal friendship, personal love, personal uh, beauty, contemplation of beauty, and things of that sort, as against obeying any sort of general rules. <clears throat> um, Moore, by the way, uh, this is sort of interesting uh, reflection of the uh, of Moore's attack on bourgeois morality or any, any kind of moral principle. Um, one of his famous statements was uh, from Moore, quote, we should spread skepticism until at last everyone knows we can know absolutely nothing, unquote. It sounds self-contradictory to me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and again, he stressed the perfect love of, and friendship as being a key, the only thing we can bank on, the only, thing, the only goals in life. And here's the way Keynes looked back on it, on the Moore circle, okay, years later. He said, we entirely repudiated a personal liability on us to obey general rules. This was a very important part of our faith. Interesting word there, faith. Violently and aggressively held... And for the outer world, it was our most obvious and dangerous characteristic. We, we repudiated entirely customary morals, conventions, and traditional wisdom. We were, that is to say, in the strict sense of the term, immoralists. Uh, and at, at the age of 55, in the eve of World War II, uh, Keynes said the Moor, that the Morai Creed is still, quote, my religion under the surface. I remain and always will remain an immoralist. Uh, unquote. And... Uh, Keynes also wrote that one of the greatest advantages of Moore's theory was that it made morals unnecessary. Uh, some interesting comments on the, on the Moorite circle, including Keynes at the time. Beatrice Webb, talking about Moore and the Moore people, of course she knew them very well, she said the whole doctrine, the whole ethical doctrine which they pursued was, quote, nothing but a metaphysical justification for doing what you like, doing what you like and, what other peop- and what other people disapprove of, unquote. Uh, also, a very keen insight, I think, of the Moore, Moore circle. So, uh, Bertrand Russell who was also an apostle, Cambridge apostle, and knew all these people very well. And what he said is that Keynes and the other group, Keynes, Strachey, and the other Moore people, quote, aim rather at a life of retirement among fine shades and, nuan- and nuanced and nice feelings, excuse me, among fine shades and, nu- and nice feelings, and conceived of the good as consisting <coughs> in the, excuse me, as consisting of the it's conceived of the good. It's consisting of the passionate mutual admirations of a clique of the elite. Unquote. I think it's a beautiful summation of Morite doctrine and Morite practice at the time. The passionate mutual admirations of a clique of the elite. Of course, they were the clique of the elite. Uh, now, one interesting thing is apparently Keynes also said that the one chapter in Moore's Principia Ethica which they ignored was this, I think, penultimate chapter called uh, Ethics in Relation to Conduct. When Moore tries to set up general rules, and this is, of course, they disregarded. Um, so, um, now another fascinating thing in the Skidelsky book about, about Keynes is that apparently, uh, as, as David mentioned, the first, um, from, uh, say, 1904 to 1914, I believe it is, uh, Keynes' whole leisure time was devoted to his treatise on probability, thinking about probability and writing the book. The book was published in 1921, but it was written before the war. So, uh, and apparently the reason why he arrived at this was he was trying to destroy general rules. In other words, basically he was trying to destroy the idea of general rules of conduct and general causal rules, and, 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 and causal rules in general. So uh, Moore had apparently fallen back on a frequentist theory of probability. In other words, 
fall back on, on, on a probabilistic causal doctrine where you say, well, at least something is probable, and therefore you go on that basis. So Keynes being against the idea of a, of a, of a, of a realistic cause and effect, cause and effect in, the, in the real world, uh, came to the conclusion, no, no, we have to uh, eliminate the frequentist theory because at least that's, that's, that's too realistic. We have to claim the probability theory is purely logical and a priori. So we have an a priori logic, which then has no relation to the real world. No, there's no relation to individual, uh, individual instances. So even if, for example, uh, let's say the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the probability of, of a, of a two-spot on a dice is one-sixth and a die is one-sixth, uh, you have to say it has nothing to do with individual die throwing. So this cuts any relationship. So the probability is, is pure logical a priorism. It has nothing to do with the real world. This eliminates any, any threat that the real world might be governed in some sense by general rules. So in other words, this whole treatise on probability is essentially part of a Morite attack on general principles, general rules. By the way, Richard von Mises, um, Ludwig von Mises' brother, was the great developer of the frequency theory of probability, and Ludwig took it over in human action. You know, he doesn't, he apparently disliked his brother intensely, but not really admit it. But uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that was, that's pretty clear. Okay, having done this, and by the way, another thing about uh, uh, Keynes' personal and uh, ideological cultural life is, he gets involved in the 19-teens in that period, and also in the 1920s with the Bloomsbury set. I think somebody, David mentioned this yesterday, or somebody else. And the Bloomsbury set was also Virginia Woolf and, and Leonard Woolf and Vanessa Bell and all these people. It was mostly King's College and other Cambridge people, almost all of them. The males, of course, were Cambridge people. And even the females are going to, I think, the Pembroke College, Pemberton College in Cambridge. And uh, their whole life and their whole writings were essentially attacks on, on bourgeois morality. It was the whole point of the whole business. And so it all, it all fits into the, uh, to the Keynes' person, lifestyle, and ideology. <clears throat> um, in 1913, he gets his first... He, he become, he'd been in the... I should say, first place, he was in the, uh, worked in the India office before he gets back to Cambridge, uh, Keynes, in, in 19... Uh, he graduates in 1906, and he goes into the India office as a clerk, and um, goes back in 1908, gets his position partially paid for by his father. And uh, he becomes an India currency and finance expert. Now, typical, this, by the way, of course, is typical of British attitude to India in general. It's not just Keynes. Uh, in all of his work in the India office, he had never expressed the slightest interest whatsoever in the Indians, in, their, in British imperialism, Indian colonialism, anything of that sort. The idea of British rule as a natural development, he just, you know, just, just, just assumed it. He also showed never, no interest whatsoever in ever visiting India as an Indian expert. This is, this, by the way, is typical also, true also of James Mill and John Stuart Mill, both India experts, both rulers of the East India Company, never had any, any intention whatsoever of visiting India. The thought it was important to visit it. <coughs> uh, at any rate, and, and as Joe Salerno said, he was a, from the very beginning against the gold standard in favor of uh, managed credit and expansionary credit. Uh, <coughs> in 1913, he gets his first big government post as a, on the Royal Commission on Indian uh, uh, Finance and Currency, and he's put in there by Edwin, his friend Edwin Montague, who was his, his, a, uh, his patron and mentor way back in college. And he, and he writes his defense of the gold exchange stand as a, as a reaction to the, Mont the great Montague silver scandal uh, at the time. The Mont the Montague and his relatives and, uh, and friends and a whole bunch of other people were involved in a big, a big scandal. And he defended the scandal as, uh, and uh, tried to defend them as, a, as an honorable, honest citizens, etc. <coughs> At any rate... And this, this, this Indian currency thing was part of that, part of that uh, move. <clears throat> um, and, of course, he calls for the, the gradual elimination of the gold standard, as Joe said. There's an interesting phrase here in his book, he's in his book, Indian Finance and Currency. He says, uh, gold is, quote, a relic of a time when governments were less trustworthy in these matters than they are now. <laughs> uh, in other words, that, what you need is good people, trustworthy people to run the thing, and then you don't have to have a gold standard. Trustworthy people, of course, mean the English ruling elite, that is, including himself. And this, of course, then we get in the general theory that gold is a barbarous relic. Uh, he also called in the book for a central bank in India, um, the blessings of a central bank, and uh, <clears throat> again, he wanted a, a, a discretionary monetary policy which would not be limited by general rules. It's always a key thing, a theme in Keynesian doctrine. Uh, and uh, as a result of his, 
he gets to know Sir Basil Blackwell, who was secretary of the Royal Commission, and indeed, he gets, when World War I comes, he immediately gets a key post in the Treasury and goes on to make a fame and, fame and fortune. <clears throat> okay, next uh, theme I think uh, I want to stress in Keynesian doctrine is, uh, Keynesian life and doctrine is his personal arrogance. Uh, incredibly arrogant, which goes along with his will to power. And including in his arrogance is his willingness to uh, have a systemic use of lies and deceit in order to gain his ends. Uh, the, um, one of the things, by the way, which have, not been, have been noted at the time and now, is this quick change of viewpoint. He was a passionate free trader for, for a long time, then he suddenly becomes a passionate protectionist, and he shifts back to passionate free trade. And he was attacked in the English press in the early 1930s for being an economic acrobat, an India rubber man, and a boneless man for this swift change of position. But all, first of all, in all these positions, he was in favor of government management. And second of all, of course, he was, uh, the will to power to him was much more important than these, these rules, which, you know, which can, be, can be shifted at will. <laughs> in fact, he went so far as to attack truth in politics even in, in general. Uh, there's a quote from Keynes. A preference for truth or for sincerity as a method may be a prejudice based on some aesthetic or personal standard Inconsistent in politics with the general, with, with, the, with the practical good. So, there's, so people, people's like of, liking of truth is just some sort of queer aesthetic. It obviously comes back to bourgeois morality, which can be should be tossed over by statesmen who want to engage in, in public welfare. Uh, also, there's a, there's a hint there that Keynes was in favor of of uh, exaggeration and lies while he was out of power. When he gets into power, he wants to be more prudent. Uh, he says at one point, words ought to be a little wild. But after, after, after he gets into power, quote, there should be no more poetic license. Uh, the, uh, Harry Johnson points out in his book on Keynes that Keynes was always, always convinced on any issue whatsoever, whatever it happens to be, that no one was doing anything about it, regardless of how serious the problem was. No one else was doing anything about it. And if they were, they were wrong. Only Keynes was right on any, any conceivable question. So Keynes was right on every question, not because he had general consistent principles, because we've seen, we've seen he hasn't, but because he was right. He was, he was the superior elite person with the will to power. Uh, the, um, he believed apparently, uh, I, I would just call Keynes an egomaniac. He believed that he could, he could conquer any problem quickly and, and come to the right conclusions on it. Uh, he... Um, it's typical of Keynes, for example, he told Hayek, there's a famous thing among Hayekians at any rate, he told Hayek at the end of his life that if his disciples went too far with inflation and public debt, he could always change things around. He'd just snap his fingers and everything would shift. Um, unfortunately, Keynes died and, and left us with his long run. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, we're now living in the Keynesian long run. He's happily dead. The... Uh, Typical, to me, the most typical thing about it, and Keynes' intellectual arrogance, ir, ir, irrespo, intellectual irresponsibility, was the way he, uh, when he, when he, he, he reviewed Mises' Money and Credit when it came out in German. He was an editor of the Economic Journal for many years, and as an editor, he reviewed in a short book note. And uh, what he said about the book was something like that. It was very short. He said, well, this is very, it's a useful book. The author is of the highest highest enlightened view, something like that, which I don't know quite what that means, anyway, highest enlightened views. But the book is disappointing because there's nothing original in it. That's why he summed it up. Now, whatever you think of Mises' theory of money and credit, it was blazingly original. One thing you can't say about it was just the old trite stuff. So, and he writes in his treatise on money, uh, 20 years later, in a footnote, that, well, you know, he, he, he doesn't really know German. He knows German fairly well, but he only knows German enough to understand ideas that he already knows. He can't, he can't understand any new ideas in German. I want, I want you to contemplate for a moment the, the, the chutzpah, the unmitigated goal of somebody who admits that he doesn't know German well enough to understand any, any new ideas and then attack Mises for not having any new ideas. <laughs> and that's, I mean, only Keynes can do that. Like, uh, okay, also, um, I think... His, his, certainly his strategy in the general theory was that of a chronic liar. I think there's no, no other way you can put it. For example, he says in the general theory, and he talks about the history of thought, which he does quite a bit in there, that nobody before him even worried about unemployment, much less thought about it. He was the only one, he, John Maynard Keynes, the only one ever to think about unemployment and worry about it, think about the solution. 
Uh, and he lived in a time, of course, that everybody before him he called classical economists, a sneer. And he lived at a time when, when, when Hayek and when Hayek's doctrines were, had become important precisely because of the tackle the unemployment problem, whether you agree with it or not. So he knew that Austria, he knew about Austrian theory, at least tackling the unemployment problem. He knew about the Pigou and so forth talking about, talking about unemployment. And yet he had the goal to claim he was the first one to ever think about it. Uh, and unfortunately, most economists since Keynes are not steeped in the history of economic thought. It's not one of the great strengths of the profession. It died out almost because as the economists began to think of economics as like physics, if you're a physicist, you don't really bother dealing with 18th century physics. And so uh, he got away with it. He managed to persuade most of the profession that nobody but before, before Keynes worried about unemployment or had any, any solution to offer, any theory to offer about it. Um, that, I think, is the most flagrant case of obvious lie. There's no, no, no way you can get around that. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, he also um, he also lied about say his law. Uh, it's, 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 he's the, and again, everybody takes this as gospel. And everybody defines say his law or, or cites it as being quote supply creates its own demand. That is not say his law. First of all, say for has never even said anything like it. But the point is that say his law, as Hutt points out, is that the supply of X constitutes a demand for Y, Z, etc. It's not, that, it's not that the supply of peaches creates a demand for peaches. The supply of peaches creates a demand for other products. The peach seller will then buy other things. So by misstating Say's law, making it seem like a loony law, you then, of course, can easily refute it. This is called a straw man tactic. And um, unfortunately, most, most historians of economic thought have taken this as gospel. Gee, Say's law says well, the only thing they've done since Keynes is to put it in the math, oddly enough. Put Say's law to math. Say did not use any mathematics. Say was a very sound on mathematical economics question. Uh, he also said that while this might be a common fact, he might not have lied about this. He might, he might have been honestly in error about Malthus. Malthus was a pre Keynesian, it's true. He was worried about underconsumption. But he, he was only a pre Keynesian for about three years after the Napoleonic Wars and the recession after that. Uh, after that, he bounced back and dropped the underconsumption stuff. So, at any rate, you can give him a p possible lie out of that. But can't, can't prove it. Uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> shuffle of papers here. Okay, now we get to Keynes's personal style. Uh, addition was systemic lying and deceit, etc. His personal style is kind of very interesting. Uh, basically, as the Johnsons point out, he flattered his students outrageously. If, he, if, he, if you were a student, he'd say any dumb thing you said, he'd say, yes, there's a great point there. So he's very charming and flattering to his students, thereby gathering their loyalty. And he was vicious to all, any of his colleagues uh, in public. In other words, he'd denounce, he'd show, try to show up his colleagues being stupid in front of his, their common students. Uh, Probably the most vicious single thing he's done, I'm not, I'm not an expert on how vicious he was, but at least to me, one of the most single vicious things that Keynes did was the way he treated uh, his old buddy Dennis Robertson, D.H. Robertson, who was a uh, his former student and colleague at Cambridge, was a much better economist than Keynes. But one of the things about Robertson was he was extremely and painfully shy, even in a period of very shy academics, of eccentrics and all that. He, was, he stood out. He was uh, almost, almost pathologically shy. Uh, for example, Cain, uh, Robertson would write out all of his lectures. Now, this was often done in those days. Okay? He'd write every word out. He refused to take any questions whatsoever. He wouldn't talk to anybody, was the, the key thing for Robertson. And then, so, and then uh, in those days, the Cambridge, inter, inter Cambridge mail system was extremely efficient. There'd be like three mail services a day. So a lot of people wrote notes to each other. But his secretary was right next to him. He'd never speak to a secretary, just write, write a message to her, so I'd leave it <laughs> on her desk. So this poor guy, and a very sweet guy, is obviously filled with gentle quotes from Alice in Wonderland, things like that. And, um, and so, Ro so Keynes, of course, knowing this, exploiting Robertson's weakness, would get, set his, his students, his intellectual thugs, on Robertson to harass him, denounce him, heckle him, and so forth and so on. Just horrible. It's a, it's a systematic torture of poor, of poor Robertson. Uh, Joan Robertson is one of the people involved in this uh, escapade. Uh, so... I think, uh, that, I think that sort of sums up, in many ways, Keynes' character, the brutality and sadism of his character. <clears throat> um, okay, one of the things I want to point out about the, about the general theory, I don't think it's been 
point out enough. He really has a certain sociology, an economic sociology and general theory. It's been sort of alluded to here this weekend. Uh, he sets up three social classes, basically. The key to his general theory are three social classes and classes in society. One is the consumers. Consumers are nice guys. They, their consumer spending is important, but they're dumb. They're robots. They're passive, determined robots. And they're... they're, they're, they're con- <laughs> <laughs> they might be lovable in a way, but they're stupid and passive and robots. Uh, then you have the investors. That's the second category, second social category. Investors are not robots. They have free will. They're dynamic. Uh, they have free will. They're interesting people and so forth. But they're irrational. They're crazy. Uh, they're loonies. <laughs> they're creatures of mood. They're optimists and pessimists. This has been alluded to here before. And they wake up in the morning and feel good to go out and invest. If they wake up tomorrow morning and feel lousy, they stop investing. So you can't rely on them. They're erratic and they're, they're screwballs and so forth and so on. And, and that's why and this, these, these two classes constitute the national output, national income and output. Fortunately, however, there's a deus ex machina, God out, of, God out of the machine. There's a third class, government. <laughs> government does not determine their, their free will and they're active and all that. They, they're not determined by anything. And government, uh, uh, contrast to being erratic and moody, as the investors are, are rational. They're supremely rational. So, especially, of course, if they're guided by a top economist like Keynes, <laughs> it's a philosopher king or a philosopher guiding the king. And so the philosopher, king, the philosopher kings can step in and correct for the moods of the investors. The investors wake up one morning, they're too pessimistic, they don't invest enough, the government steps in and spends. If, if, uh, if, the, if the investors are too little, too manic, and they, spend too, they invest too much, the government steps in and taxes them, or us. And so the government is the, is the wise governor or balancing machine in the system, uh, since they're wise and supremely rational. By the way, that's the reason why government spending in the Keynesian national income statistics is always considered as similar to investment. It's honorary investment. Whatever the government does is investing because they're, they're, they have free will. And so in a contrast to consumers who are robotically determined. So uh, once one points this out, I don't think we have to go gauge too much in, to see the fallacies of this, <laughs> of this assumption. <clears throat> Uh, okay, the, uh, we now get to, um, to Keynes' uh, political philosophy, which I'm going to do too much so far. And uh, it hasn't been stressed enough, I think, in the liter- literature. For one thing, there's the famous, uh, one, one key to Keynes' uh, political philosophy is, uh, is, is Keynes' forward to his German edition. Uh, this is not even mentioned by Harrod. I don't know if Skidelsky would mention I think Skidelsky is a very good historian and so forth. But Harrod's allegedly definitive life of Keynes. There's not a single mention of the fact that shortly after the book General Theory came out in 1936, Keynes wrote a foreword for the German edition, which came out in late 1936. It, it came out very quickly after the uh, English edition. And he writes this foreword, which has was only been translated by obscure uh, subversives in, in the United States, like Henry Hazlitt <laughs> and Jim Morton. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, it's in German, for those who want to, who want to check the, the translation. Anyway, he says in there, he's talking now about the, about the German regime as of 1936, in other words, the, the Nazi regime. He says, quote, the theory of aggregate production, which is the point of the following book, the general theory, nevertheless can be much easier adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state than the theory of production and distribution of a given production put forth under conditions of free competition and a large degree of laissez-faire. This is one of the reasons I call my theory a general theory. In other words, the theory is general for one reason, because it's better suited to a totalitarian state if it put it into effect and to a rotten, free competitive society. Um, so, so he looked at the Nazi regime and he thought, this is great. It's a beautifully, um, beautifully suited to put, to put Keynesian doctrine into effect, which indeed it was. Uh, in addition to that, in, 19, in 1930... Keynes was extremely interested in Sir Oswald Mosley's uh, uh, fascist national economic plan, which he proposed in 1930. He was, and Sir Oswald Mosley, Mosley set up the, new, the so-called New Party, the fascist party in, uh, in the early 30s. <clears throat> Skidelsky, by the way, was not, I'm going to just correct Mark on this, he's not a lifelong student of Keynes. Before he wrote the biography of Keynes, he wrote a biography of Mosley, so he's particularly suited to understand the Mosley-Keynes connection. At any rate, uh, so, so, so much was he in favor of fascism in the early 30s that Virginia Woolf wrote to an old friend of hers in a letter and said, 
Gee, she's afraid that Keynes might start converting her to, converting her to a form of fascism. She, was, she felt in danger of her soul at that point. Uh, as for communism, Keynes was more ambivalent. Um, he, um, on one hand, he admired the young intellectual communists of the late 1930s because they reminded him of, and I get this, this is, kind of a, this is a real corker, they reminded him of a typical nonconformist English gentleman who made the Reformation, fought the Great Rebellion in the 17th century, won us our civil and religious liberties, and humanized the working classes last century. Unquote. That's an interview in the New Statesman in 1939. Kind of an odd way of looking at the Communist Party. Uh, on the other hand, he criticized the communists for the other side of the Reformation Great Rebellion coin, because they were Puritans. Because they believed, of course, in bourgeois morality. Not that too many people were more Puritan than them. Orthodox Stalinist type. So Keynes' anti-Puritanism then comes out. He says, he says, uh, our Cambridge, he's attacking the Cambridge undergraduates who go to Russia in the late 30s and like it. He says, our Cambridge undergraduates disillusioned when they go to Russia when they find it, quote, dreadfully uncomfortable. Of course not. That's what they're looking for. In other words, he's attacking communism because it's, it's too puritanical. It makes people, it's, it emphasizes <coughs> austerity and, and uh, lack of hedonism. Of course, the his, his moral philosophy is, is basically hedonistic, and they're anti-hedonistic. They, they want people to shape up and, uh, and, uh, and all that, and he doesn't, that's what he doesn't like. <clears throat> Another thing he doesn't like about communism, in addition to being puritanical, is his proletarian. Somebody mentioned, I think somebody mentioned this yesterday. Uh, how, quote, how can I adopt such a creed which, preferring the mud to the fish, exalts the boorish proletariat above the bourgeoisie and the intelligentsia, who are the quality in life and surely carry the seeds of all human advancement. There I think we have a key. And who, wants these, who wants these grubby proletariat? I mean, he's interested in the bourgeoisie and the intellectual means of power elite. That means him. I mean, he said somewhere, I think somebody mentioned this yesterday, he, uh, and when you get down to the class struggle between the bourgeois and the proletariat, he's a bourgeois. Why should he join the proletariat? Well, that's a useful, you know, it's an interesting point. <laughs> Why indeed? <laughs> so, uh, for all these reasons, he was much more attracted to fascism than he was to with the communist uh, okay, to get to um, to get to Keynes the person, just to sum up Keynes the person, uh, the uh, there's one attitude. I'll, I'll talk about one attitude, and then I'll talk about my own, I guess. One is Lionel Robbins' attitude. Lionel Robbins converted to Keynesianism. Although a new book by O'Brien on Robbins claims he didn't really convert or he shifted back. But anyway, he certainly did convert in many ways in, in his autobiography. He writes about he writes about Keynes personally. Okay, and this, is, now, this is not irony. I want to point out to you, this is not being satiric here. This is straight stuff. This is Robbins talking about Keynes as he appeared at a pre Bretton Woods conference, a draft conference, in Atlantic City in June 1944. He's writing about Keynes. Quote, Keynes was in his most lucid and persuasive mood, and the effect was irresistible. Keynes must be one of the most remarkable men in the world. Excuse me, one of the most remarkable men that have ever lived. The quick logic, the wide vision, above all the incomparable sense of the fitness of words, all combined to make something several degrees beyond the limit of ordinary human achievement. Uh, only Churchill, he has, is of comparable stature. And then he says, but Keynes uses the classical style of our life and language, it is true, but it's shot through with something which is not traditional, a unique, unearthly quality, of which one can only say that it's pure genius. The American sat in trance as a godlike visitor sang and the golden light played all around. The godlike visitor sang and the golden light played all around. That's Robinson's view of Keynes. Oh, before I get to my own view, I just I missed something here. I'm going to backtrack a second. Uh, he's, also, he's also appalled the excesses of communism, and he says, he wrote uh, about communist rule, in part perhaps it, the Soviet rule, is the fruit of some beastliness in the Russian nature or in the Russian and Jewish natures, when as now they are allied together. Uh, also, he said he had doubts, about talking about communism, he had doubts that, quote, Russian communism, unquote, would, quote, make Jews less avaricious, unquote. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the godlike figure. Now, to, to Robbins, he's the godlike figure with a golden light playing all around the halo. I've got a slightly different assessment. <laughs> uh, sum up Keynes. Uh, arrogant, sadistic, power, power besotted bully, <laughs> deliberate and systemic liar, uh, intellectually irresponsible, an opponent of principle, in favor of short term hedonism, a nihilistic opponent of bourgeois morality in all of its areas, a hater of thrift, 
saving somebody who wanted to liquidate the creditor class, exterminate the creditor class, an imperialist, an anti-Semite, and a fascist. Uh, outside of that, I guess he was a great guy. <laughs>